So let's get started with today's webinar, Reversing the Decline of Quail in Texas. And this is a partnership. This, web, this website is made available to you through a partnership with Bob Barton, Bill Hubbard, and myself, Eric Taylor. And we're proud to work with each individual to pr provide these webinars to you. So, because I'm having trouble with words today, apparently, I'll pass it on over to Dr. Dale Rollins. Take it away, please. Thank you, Eric, and I appreciate Eric's assistance in helping uh, support the webinar that we're going to do today. As I peruse the list of people that are attending, I see a lot of faces that are, a lot of names that are new to me, so I'm glad to have you aboard, as well as a couple of seasoned students of quail, and we hope that's what you all become uh, by the end of this presentation. Our topic, as uh, Eric said, is reversing the decline of quail in Texas, and it's uh, put on jointly today by Texas A&M Agri Life Extension and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Robert Perez, who works at Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, was supposed to be a co-speaker on today's program, but had, his family had some medical emergencies and he had to bow out, so his priorities are where they need to be, and I'll be covering that portion of the uh, webinar for him. Uh, we're going to talk about the status of quail, uh, both nationally and in the state of Texas, various parts of Texas. Talk about, uh, at the state and national level, what some strategic recovery uh, issues are and initiatives. And then we're going to spend much of the program on uh, the Texas A&M uh, AgriLife uh, Quail Initiative, which is uh, basically some new research opportunities, and uh, outreach education. And then, as I have time, I'll talk about the 2014 hunting forecast. And if you have any questions or whatever, again, put those in the chat box, and Eric will interrupt me. We'll have some scheduled breaks here in, and an opportunity to answer those questions. The decline of quail over the last 50 years has been called America's greatest conservation tragedy. Uh, go, to, go to just about any state in the southeastern half of the U.S., and they'll tout their, uh, their programs with white-tailed deer and wild turkey, different things like that, white winged doves, but nobody crows very loudly when it mentions Bob White Quail because this is the trajectory across the uh, southeastern U.S., across the range of the Bob Whites, and you can see that if you were flying a Cessna 150, you would definitely be looking for a place to land because you're in trouble. And we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those factors are that may be causing that. Now, we'd like to think in Texas that we're immune to that, and in fact, I'm going to suggest that we were quite smug quite uh, confident that uh, we were not going to have that decline problem. Uh, for me, it, it hit me in about 1991 when I first saw a report that uh, quail hunting was due to be recreationally extinct by the year 2005, and I thought, poppycock, it's not going to happen in West Texas. But it raised my awareness and my level of doubt, and uh, sure enough, beginning about 1994, we've had a problem ever since. So we'll be talking about some some of the factors that are involved there and the solution or uh, what we hope will be some solutions to that. I'll break the uh, program up into different segments, but just to uh, keep you engaged, I've inserted several questions. And so I'm going to say anytime we see the, uh, the thinker over here, that will be an indication that, um, let me find my laser pointer here. Anytime we see the thinker over here, well, that's going to be an opportunity for us to ask a little question so I can determine what your quail IQ is. So, first question, in which Texas city was this picture taken? Please respond to the polls. At College Station, Memphis, Wellington, or Fal Furious? I'll give you about 10 seconds to complete that. Come see who among you travels the roads of Texas. And the correct answer is Memphis, Texas. Uh, Quail, Texas is a little community. Uh, it's struggling as well. It's in Collinsworth County, but that street sign is actually in Memphis pointing off to the east right there along Highway 287. Uh, Eric, were you going to display the results? I, f I forget. If you'd like, like for me to. Maybe not. Okay. 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 Yeah, if you don't want to, go ahead and display the results.
So, some of you haven't traveled West Texas very much. It didn't look like most of you say College Station. Oh, no, 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 no. Anyway, up in the southeastern part of the Panhandle, Memphis, Texas. But that's the protocol we'll follow. The first part of the webinar is going to be talking uh, about the, again, the status of quail both nationally and then specifically in Texas. And I'll be uh, addressing those points in, the, in this context relative uh, to what I hope Mr. Perez would uh, have mentioned if he had been available to join us today. So I put the slides together, and if they're not quite right, well, it's my fault and not Robert's, but I think I'm fairly close. If we look at the national perspective at three time periods, look up here in the upper left, that's here from 68 to 77, and then over here from 78 to 87, and the last one of these time lapse maps we have is 88 to 97. So remember, even this one is 15 years old. The point you want to look at is how dark is the red shading? How dark is the red shading? And in the uh, early 70s, there were a lot of quail over here in the, along the Atlantic seaboard in the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and of course then Oklahoma and Texas. As time has progressed, you'll see basically a fading of those populations to the east fewer and fewer bob whites. Still some strongholds here, uh, basically in the rolling plains of Texas and in the South Texas plains. And then as we go to the last one again, keep in mind 15 years ago, we see those continual light, continued lightening or fading of the whole map indicating lower bob white abundance. Again, the strongholds are still here and in South Texas, but even there, populations have tended to wane somewhat. Nationally, and, I, and I'm not sure what happened to this slide right here, this is supposed to be a shrike, a loggerhead shrike, if you don't know what that bird is. Uh, some people call it a butcher bird. But I want to contrast what the population declines over the last uh, 40 years have been relative to the bob white and then to the loggerhead shrike. And you'll see that they follow essentially the same trajectory. What does this mean? Well, you got to think about it. We're contrasting two different birds here. One of them is an omnivore, it's a prey species, it's a ground nester, and it's a hunted species as opposed to a shrike, which is a carnivorous bird. It's a predator, a solitary nester, and it's not hunted, but again, they share the same trajectory. That tells us something is wrong with the system. And in this case, it's basically the, uh, the warm season grasses, the prairie type uh, country. And so as our grasslands go, our native grasslands, so go many of these birds, and the bob white has kind of become the icon of that demise. But there are many other birds that are also declining uh, in the southeastern part of the U.S. Here would be some examples here. Uh, Meadowlarks would be familiar to many of you, uh, but some of you may not know what a grasshopper sparrow or a dick sizzle is, but these are all grassland nesting birds. And again, all those populations have declined, some at even a more severe rate than what the Bob White has. So I like to refer to the, to the Bob White as the canary of the prairie. Just like the canary in the coal mine, when Bob White populations are going down to the level that they've gone down over the last 40 years, it suggests something is happening out there. And we'll get into what several of those factors may be. If you want to learn more about the national situation, the status of Bob Whites and recovery efforts at the national level, I would refer you to the National Bob White Conservation is Initiative, or NBCI. They've got a real good website, bringbackbobwhites.org, and you can not only learn a lot about what's going on nationally, they have what's called the Bob White Library, and there's a lot of good information there. You can download digitally PDF forms as far as a lot of the literature that's available on Bob White Management. So I would encourage you to visit that website at your opportunity. Okay, time for another little IQ question. How many eggs are typically found in a Bob White's first nest? Two, four, eight, or 14? Please answer now. Okay, Eric, will you show us your, oh, I'll go to the next slide and show the correct answer. The correct answer is 14. I'm sorry, Eric, I erased your graph. Eric, could you post it again? Okay, 
And it looks like about half of you got the uh, answer correct. Uh, the puck size will range anywhere from 12 to 17 eggs, but typically the first nest of the season will be the largest. Uh, a nest that might be uh, developed, say, in late August will probably be down to maybe eight or nine eggs. Just a little bit about the biology of our favorite bird. In Texas, again, because we're on the western perimeter of the Bob White, we like to think of ourselves as the Alamo of quail conservation. If we can't stop the demise out here, if we can't stop the bleeding and begin to move things back to the east, we're in a world of hurt. And so, again, a lot of uh, scrutiny, a lot of new efforts over the last eight to ten years have been aimed, have been focused at the Bob White. And we'll talk about some of those as we go through. This is that same kind of map that I showed you a while ago, but specific to Texas. Look what happened in 78, in 87, and in 97. And again, these are 17 years old at this point in time. But you'll see that the historic rolling plains, if you were up around Archer City, you were at the epicenter of it, it's moved to the west a little bit. And overall, it's faded across the state. It's faded. Very few quail in uh, eastern parts of Texas. Our strongholds still being down here in the uh, Falfurias, Hedonville area, and then up here again in the western part of the Rolling Plains at this time. I do have some good news that I'll share at the end of the webinar in that numbers this year, for the first time in at least 70 years, numbers are up statewide. And so we'll talk about some of those hot spots at the end of the webinar. In Texas, uh, the issues that we think are really the biggest as far as what's affecting quail or what's causing the decline of quail are these three right here, land management practices, and then what, the, what we generically refer to as habitat fragmentation, the dissolution or the breakup, the parcelization of bigger pieces of property, bigger ranches, in the smaller ranchettes. And when that happens, invariably, the intensity of use increases. So it becomes less, less quail friendly, typically, as we go from larger properties to smaller properties. In terms of grazing management, chronic overstocking, overgrazing, in my opinion, is the most pervasive issue that we have in quail, at least in the Golden Plains, which is where I work primarily. It's gotten better in some areas, but there's still an awful lot of country, especially when we go through dry spells like we have the last five years that are just chronically overgrazed. And uh, you can appreciate that's not very good for quail with as many enemies as you have uh, if all of your nesting cover is gone. Conversion of native pasture, or again, these warm season grasses, your little blue stem, your side oats grommet, your Indian grass, conversion of those to tame pasture or introduced pasture such as Bermuda grass, such as overall blue stems. Those are good decisions if you're in the livestock business. Those are poor decisions if you're in the quail business. My preacher often says you're free to choose your actions, but you're not free to choose the consequences. Over the eastern half of Texas, the loss of Bob Whites, the decline of Bob Whites, is easily explained, in my opinion. You can see it on the landscape. As we go west of Highway 35, it becomes a little bit more cryptic as far as what might be happening. And then the lack of fire in certain uh, ecoregions, especially in places like the cross timbers. Uh, if, if you don't continue to use fire, your brush gets too thick, especially things like red cedar. And uh, that can be a real issue throughout the eastern part of the Golden Plains up through Oklahoma and through there. This graph shows the decline of quail hunters from the last 40 years or so. 1981 up to 2011, 30 years. So it's trended. It's followed quite well that that uh, decline of the Bob White. This is the, the dotted line, the dotted line being the uh, decline of blue quail participation. But this line is especially troubling. You might think, well, it, it needs it's, it's it's supply and demand. If there's no quail, it doesn't need to be any hunting. And so our bird dogs get fat. We get our we get fat as hunters. And we become dis, uh, disenfranchised. We, uh, we take up golf or something else. But there's another reason to be concerned about that, because quail are very valuable birds, economically speaking. We've done some studies at two different times looking to see what the avid quail unlimited member in 1999, or in 2010, we uh, surveyed quail coalition, which basically uh, uh, 
succeeded uh, Quail Unlimited in Texas. In 1999, the average Texas Quail QU member spent over $10,000 per year in pursuit of his hobby. In 2010, that dropped, but it was still a very significant amount, $8,600 during that time. The majority of that those dollars are spent in the destination county. If you're a county like uh, Fisher County or uh, Cottle County or Brooks County, the money generated from quail hunting and from hunters is a tremendous economic uh, surge to those uh, local economies. It's been the money spent on lodging, fuel, it touches many hands. Uh, it touches the landowner's hands. Good quail hunting is typically worth at least as much, if not more, than what a grazing lease is. So those are all very uh, Important avenues for uh, that are that quail and a good quail population helps to fuel. If you take that figure, ten, I'm sorry, $8,600, and you figure out how many quail that that average hunter shot in 2010, that cost about $254 a bird of what I call quail escargot. If you're a quail hunter and your significant other is uh, listening to today's seminar, I may have just uh, kicked you in the shin. Sorry about that. This map shows across the range of the Bob White uh, through the uh, National Bob White Conservation Initiative. Uh, four or five years ago, biologists from throughout the southeast sat down and, and categorized certain areas. Where is the greatest potential for restoration in these areas that are either blue in color or this caramel kind of tan? Where are the areas that have the least or the lowest opportunity? Kind of a triage type thing. If we're going to strategically improve quail populations, where do we need to focus our efforts? And so you can see uh, in Texas, uh, there have been several quail focal areas defined by Texas Parks and Wildlife. This eastern rolling plains right in here uh, from roughly Clay County down to Shackford County is one of those. This is uh, Navarra County right in here. And then there's uh, Colorado County. There's some work uh, being done right off down here, some what they call focal areas where they target special funding for intensive quail management. If you want to learn more about that, you'll need to visit with your local uh, Parks and Wildlife biologist. Some of the solutions that Parks and Wildlife uh, recommends, number one, develop a rational scientific, scientific approach to species recovery. As an example, don't think you're going to jumpstart a population by using pin-raised quail. It ain't going to happen. It's been tried every different way in the book. So something else has got to take the place. There's an awful lot of money, time, and effort spent on releasing pinnary birds thinking you're going to get a crop population. You're not. Follow the footsteps of other successes. There are some successes uh, throughout the range of Bob Whites, uh, some in Missouri, especially in Old War, some in uh, northern Florida and southern Georgia. They've got that. I had an opportunity to hunt down there several years ago on Tall Timbers Research Station. On a walk hunt, we flushed 13 coveys about wild Bob Whites that day. Pretty impressive. The downside of that is it's very expensive. They spend about $80 an acre a year, $80 per acre per year, uh, in terms of land management, in terms of predator control, in terms of uh, supplemental feeding, but they can uh, make it work down there. They've, they've cracked the code. It's just expensive to do it. Capitalize on the power of partnerships, and I'll, I'll just give you an example of who some of those players are in just a second, and then seek the public buy-in and support because it's going to take some major changes in the way we look at land and think about land, especially east of I-35, if we're going to restore quail in those areas. Here is a page showing many of them. I'm not saying it's all the partners that uh, the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, is, is enlisting as they work towards their uh, quail recovery initiative. But uh, the importance of various state agencies, federal agencies, conservation organizations like Quail Coalition, Texas Wildlife Association, the various universities, all of these different players have a seat at the table and are working together to strategically try to come up with a solution. So the conclusion of the Texas and the, the status in Texas Parks and Wildlife portion of this is uh, about seven bullet points. I'm just going to scan them pretty quickly. The project will take 25 to 30 years to complete. I hope not. I'll be too old to hunt. So let's fast forward that any way we can. All the easy wildlife restoration projects have been completed. Let me repeat that. All the easy wildlife restoration projects have been completed. The wild turkey, the white-tailed deer, some of those. It's going to be much more difficult to restore and replenish by whites than those others. 
No one group can do it alone. It's going to take partnerships. It'll take a huge shift in societal values and attitudes. You can't have that nice pastoral setting of Bermuda grass and a few scattered oak trees and think it's going to be a quail habitat. It's not going to be. It will require unique and inventive ways to change obstacles into opportunities. The Farm Bill might be an example of that, the Federal Farm Bill. State and federal agencies working together and landowners will be the backbone of this initiative. And so that's why I, as I get into the outreach portion, we focus, uh, AgriLife uh, focuses our outreach opportunities to landowners because they're the folks in the back 40. They're the ones that if we can't change it there, it's not going to work. And that concludes the, the portion for uh, that Robert was going to be responsible for today. Uh, here's Robert's email address. I would encourage you to uh, visit with him if you have any more questions about that or visit Texas Parks and Wildlife's website uh, about other quail-related information. Time for another IQ question. This is, could be a good one. How many functional ovaries does a quail hen have? One, two, four, or none? Please answer now. How many functional ovaries does a quail hen have? One, two, four, or none? Correct answer is one. I think the most popular answer, as I saw the graph, was two. Uh, birds typically just have one functional ovary. Quail, in this case, certainly do. And it's always on the left side. That's a weight-saving device. If you're a bird that weighs 160 grams, uh, weight is a very important consideration for you. That ovary will be the size of uh, look like a small cluster of grapes in May, and during the winter it, it recrudesces, it, it, it resorbs into where it's uh, barely uh, the size of a, a BB. But uh, only one functional ovary, always on the left side. Just a little trivia question. Okay. I'll Talk about now my portion, uh, which will focus on quail decline and, and what are we doing to combat it. Uh, I think about are, are people confuse the term quail decline, and they think about it in one of two ways, but they're not synonymous. Some biologists refer to quail decline as, as they'll say, "My white populations have been declining for the last 150 or 200 years." Okay, I'm not particularly concerned about that. As recently as 2006, we had a slug of our whites in my part of the world. That's what I'm interested in. So I'm more interested in what, what I call acute quail decline over the last 20 years. And this will get the attention of the rest of the presentation. To show you an example of the rolling plains, these are data from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. If you go to their website and go to the quail hunting forecast, you can download these trend data. Uh, these are from roadside counts that they conduct in August for various ecoregions of Texas. I'm focused on the rolling plains. And these are the numbers from 1978 to 19, I'm sorry, to 2012. Something, in my opinion, happened about 1994. Now, I'm a student of what I call patternology, the scientific study of patterns. I look at something. And I say, what happened? You see, our populations for years were boom or bust, called eruptive populations, probably tied to the uh, meteorolo meteorological cycles, El Nino, La Nina. So when we have an El Nino cycle, we tend to have these nice booms. La Nina will give us the bust. Something happened during this time period. We still have booms. They just don't boom very high. Only about four years out of the last 20 have been above the long-term average. So this is what I'm really concerned about. And I don't necessarily have the answer for, all, for what might have happened here. Maybe more than one thing as we'll discuss in a minute. But if you have ideas, i am always uh, got open ears and would like to hear what you think might have been involved. But if I go to South Texas, I go to the Edwards Plateau, Looking at 1994 time frame, and something seemed to happen. So it happened over a large area, and it's tended to suppress those numbers over the last 20 years. So what was it? What is the smoking gun? 
and I'll uh, let you look at some of these various uh, hypotheses, if you will, because I'm not saying I've got them all listed here, but these were maybe 15 of what I consider to be some of the more common as I travel the state and the states to hear about what they think has happened to their quail hunting. Give you time to think about those just a minute, and then I'm going to tell you that the smoking gun is probably not a single shot. It's probably a revolver. There are probably multiple things happening at the same time. And as I look at these various various hypotheses or cause agents here, I, you know, I can pick. If I'm mad at feral hogs, I'll say that's the problem. If I'm mad at raccoons, I'll say predators are the problem. You've heard about aflatoxins in deer corn. Is that the problem? What about these eye worms that they're finding now? Climate change, genetically modified organisms. A lot of you in the east or southeastern part of the state would, would hang your head on fire ants right there. Uh, the biologists would say habitat loss. So there's a lot of different uh, potential problems out there, many of which are no doubt uh, interacting or confounding the issue. I'm especially intrigued at this point are quite intrigued about genetically modified organisms. And the reason I say I'm intrigued is I look back at that graph and something happened about 1994. There was a uh, insecticide, uh, uh, it's called a neonicotinoid insecticide, a midocropriate, that gained wide use. It was introduced in 92, and by 94 it was already widely used as an insecticide in wheat and cotton. And so I'm curious about what the potential for some of those would be. But again, we know weather is an important driver for us in Texas. Anywhere from 50 to 90 percent of the variability from year to year is probably brought about by our, our precipitation patterns. So all of these things, as you think about what's happened, be very slow to blame any particular one. Realize that it's not operating in a vacuum. A lot of different things happening at the same time. All right, time for another IQ test. Which of the following groups of animals tends to be the greatest threat to quail in Texas during the breeding season? Hawks and owls, snakes, mesocarnivores, that's skunks, raccoons, bobcats, or poachers. Which of those four is the greatest threat to quail during the breeding season? like most of the polling is done. The correct answer is mesocarnivores, the, uh, again, the, the raccoons especially, in my opinion. So uh, looks like many of you got the correct answer on that. Good job. Now we're going to move into Texas A&M AgriLife's uh, reversing the quality plan initiative. This was brought about in the last legislative session. For those of you that hunt quail in Texas, you've been paying seven dollars for an upland game bird stamp for about the last ten years, but that money has not been available to Texas Parks and Wildlife to spend. It's been cubby held off to the side by the legislature to use for uh, balancing the state budget or doing some other practices with it. But uh, Chancellor John Sharp of Texas A&M uh, was, uh, in my opinion, was uh, especially uh, uh, important and influential and uh, was able to acquire an exceptional item. Basically, this is a special uh, legislative allocation of $2 million of that game bird money uh, to be able to put that to use for quail decline and quail recovery. So it's a joint effort between Extension and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, as well as some other players. Uh, there's some other monies that come in for Texas Wildlife Association, uh, big, big chapter the Cubby chapter of Quail Coalition, and so another $350,000 was added to that. All of that is, money, is greatly appreciated. That money was divvied up into several pieces of pie. One was research, which accounted for about uh, $1.2 million worth of that. There were 21 different proposals submitted. Those were rated by a panel, and 13 projects were eventually funded. Uh, those funds, those projects went to Texas A&M University, several different aspects of Texas A&M, Texas A&M Kingsville, Texas Tech University, University of North Texas, and the Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation. So that's how the money was divvied up. Look at some of the research topics. Uh, there's uh, 
the impact of parasites. You may have read about some of the work being done by the Rolling Plains Core Research Foundation at Texas Tech on the eye worms, and we think that they could, have, could be important. So there's going to be some follow-up uh, efforts done on that to see how they impact uh, the population levels. Impacts of uh, toxins, uh, you've again heard about aflatoxins and deer corn. Uh, what is the impact of that? Uh, developing and testing a, a simple test for landowners to, to, to determine if their deer corn that they're putting out has too much aflatoxin and would thus uh, pose a hazard to quail. And then here's that group of insecticides I talked about a while ago, neonicotinoid insecticides. And there's two projects being funded that uh, look at that. Now, those uh, particular compounds are gaining a lot of scrutiny among the folks uh, concerned about honeybees. Uh, they've been banned in, the, in, in Europe, and they're uh, getting a lot of scrutiny, if you will, uh, as it relates to, hum to uh, honeybees and uh, an issue that we look at in relative to uh, exposure to quail. Diagnostic testing for diseases and some field studies on health factors as influenced, as influenced by environmental factors. Continuing on with some of those research topics, uh, this will be a very popular one, the impacts of predation by fire ants and by feral hogs. Uh, in case of the fire ants, they'll be looking at areas that uh, were treated with a fire ant insecticide, large areas versus one that was not, and being able to look at the impact on recruitment and see if, those, uh, if they can tie that fire ants. Uh, anecdotally, I was down in the uh, in the uh, referral uh, area here about a month or so ago and had a quail appreciation day down there. And they're having the best quail season right now they've had in many years, your quail, best quail outlook. They, the locals, at least, are crediting that not to the great rain, but to the dry weather the last couple of years. And they think that's suppressed the fire ants um, over the last couple of years. Hearsay, but I thought it was interesting. The hogs, uh, you probably are familiar with here. Again, we say there's two types of landowners in Texas, those that have feral hogs today, those that will have someday. The uh, latter group is getting smaller by the day. Uh, feral hogs are capable of being very uh, effective predators of uh, eggs. And so uh, Dr. Cooper at Uvalde is looking at some data she's collected down there to try to decipher that relationship. Two projects going on, one at Texas Tech and one at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch on uh, restoring blue quail, which uh, used to be extremely common to the western Rolling Plains, but it disappeared since 1988. And then finally, some work, uh, the, the Bob White genome was completed about a year ago, and there'll be some uh, genomic sequencing and uh, other things to do with the DNA roadmap of the quail and what uh, potential that might hold for, for quail researchers quail management in the future. Now let's move to the outreach education. Uh, let me introduce uh, Becky Ruzicka. Becky is my colleague. She's uh, in the Dallas area. She and I team up and, and we do uh, various educational outreach opportunities that I'll get into in just a second. And then also we've got uh, 40 county extension agents involved in various projects across the state. So uh, we see the quail initiative as a great way. We've had real good uh, reception, participation by many of the county agents, and so uh, we think that's a win-win. We're training them to be uh, better informed managers of their rural lands, ranch lands for quail, and it's helping us organize uh, more projects in a number of counties. Our first uh, cylinder, if you will, in our revolver of outreach are what we call Quail Appreciation Days. I've been doing these since 1998. I've done about 65 of them to date in, in nearly or most of the counties in West Texas, at least. And there's six hour workshops for what I call students of quail. Uh, we learn about the anatomy of the quail, we learn about its biology, we learn about its management in the morning, and then in the afternoon we're on site and we talk about things like grazing management, brush management, nesting habitat those types of things. So it's a learn by doing kind of thing. Uh, we uh, we did uh, six of those workshops uh, in May, and we have another six coming up in the uh, next month or so. So Archer County, Palo Pinto, Zavala, McMullen, Jim Wells, Duval, and Wilson County. So if you're anywhere near one of those that property or know someone that does, you might want to encourage them to attend one of those. I think they'll really enjoy it and they'll get a lot out of it as far as appreciating quail. 
Now, when I say appreciate quail, I don't necessarily mean just to clap for the quail, although we all value quail very highly like that. But I'm really focusing in on this context, to judge with heightened awareness. How does your grazing management, do you appreciate the impacts of your grazing management on the bottom line? Do you appreciate the impacts of your deer management or of your brush management or any of these kind of things? Again, you're free to choose your actions, but you're not free to choose the consequences. Appreciating what those consequences are and then making a conscious decision about whether or not you want to work for or again quail on your back 40. Uh, we use some very uh, simple, well, very easy to implement uh, surveys uh, for evaluating quail habitat. We've developed some surveys that we, I'm going to credit Ricky Lennox with the NRCS and Kent Mills, uh, both of whom have worked with me with the Bob White Brigade for many years. And they developed a quail habitat evaluation form for 14 year olds. And we use the same form now for adults. And it works very well. So uh, come to a quail appreciation day and you'll learn more about about that. Also done the Texas Quail Index in 40 counties. The Texas Quail Index means that a county extension agent will pick a cooperator in his county. We, uh, Becky and I helped them get lined out as far as how are we going to count quail and things that happen or impact quail. And so one of the things that we have them do is we, uh, we do whistle counts. We show them how to do a whistle counts. We get them lined up as far as setting a transect out show them how to use GPS, make a map, and so forth, and then actively get them out listening early morning, listening to those quail. There were probably more people had their ears cocked skyward this year listening for quail than ever before in the state of Texas. And we're proud of that, and we hope to have even more next year. There's an old saying that the best fertilizer is the footprint of the farmer. If we can get the landowners and the people out on the ground involved in the data collection process, that's a tried and true method of extension education. We show them how to set up dummy nests. These are especially important. I think it's one of the most critical things that we do in the Texas Quail Index. We put, they'll put out 24 nests, 12 of them being grass, 12 of them being prickly pear, and then they examine those at 14 and 28 days to see how many of them are impacted. They count how much available nesting cover is available. And then we try to estimate what is the mesocarnivore abundance, the, the predator abundance. Historically, we've done it with scent stations. We'll put out flour and then uh, count tracks in there. This year, we're using cameras. We're using game cameras. Nearly everybody has game cameras. We're actually providing two game cameras to each county. And the, the big Covey chapter of Crow Coalition that provided four uh, cameras for each one of the counties around Wichita Falls here. So if you're in a uh, quail conservation organization, you want to become a partner with us on this, we'd be glad to hear from you. The Quail Appreciation Days were the Quail 101. They're the freshman level quail programs. If you're a serious student of quail, we try to recruit you into becoming what we call a quail master. Quail masters meet four times, uh, first time in, in April, and typically June, August, and October, three days at a time. And we tour much of West and South Texas. We go to the best managed properties and state of Texas gets you on ranches that you couldn't get on any other way. And you get to observe firsthand what their strategies are and uh, learn both the formal education as well as the network of the individuals that can really help you become a better quill maker. Next, this next year, we're finishing up the 2014 class next month. But next year, we'll be recruiting and we'll have the South Texas Quill Masters, which will have three of the four sessions being held in South Texas. So if you're interested in that, I'll give you more information about where you can follow up on it. We started the Bob White Brigade 23 years ago. Uh, this has been my proudest accomplishment of my career. Uh, I hope that you've heard about it. I hope that you'll consider sending your kid or, or your grandkid or maybe uh, volunteering for five days as a company leader. That program has been cloned now to, uh, to five other camps. We have two Buckskin Brigades, two uh, Bass Brigade, a uh, Waterfowl Brigade, and a Ranch Brigade. So plenty of opportunities. Go to their website, texasbrigades.org, to learn more about this great information. We teach those kids uh, all we can about quail and leadership. And what we're really trying to do is not necessarily uh, groom the next uh, game warden or the next quail biologist, but 
we want to have a federal judge that's conscious and conscientious about natural resource matters. So we want to have a congressman. We want to have a, a mayor. So that's what we're trying to do is groom these young people to be successful and still have some knowledge of what natural resource conservation is all about. I we're quite active uh, on uh, on the internet. Uh, we have a uh, a quail page on the uh, Wildlife and Fishery Sciences uh, website, wildlife.tamu.edu. Some good information there. You can glean several uh, webisodes that have been done. Where uh, Becky's been quite active with a uh, reversing the quail decline Facebook page. So if you're in if you're on Facebook, I hope that you'll look us up and uh, subscribe to that. Uh, We'll try to keep you updated on the various things. Several publications uh, been, are available in the PDF format. Uh, many publications are available to you free, uh, so you can find out everything. And then again, go back to that, uh, bring back bobwhites.org and that Quail Library there if you want some more digital information that's available to you free via the internet. You might say, well, given today's uh, importance of uh, Mobile devices, is there an app for that? Well, as of a month ago, yes. Uh, Extension has just released two apps to support the Quail Decline Initiative. The first one's on habitat evaluation, so we take that same form that I showed you all ago, and it's all on your smartphone. These are for iPhone users, and so you can do all that with your iPhone. And then the other one is a bottle-up management calendar so that lets you know what you'll be thinking about uh, at particular times of year. And those are both free. So you can go to the App Store and um, and request those. I believe this is the last IQ question. So what is the minimum number of potential nest sites per acre that a manager should seek to provide in order to provide good nesting cover for quail? Is it 25 per acre, 125 per acre, 300 per acre, or greater than 1,000 per acre? Vote your choice now. How many basketball-sized clumps of little blue stem, for example, would you like to see on a per acre basis for good nesting cover? Survey says, what you got, Eric? Okay, survey spent between 125 and 300. I would argue the correct answer is 300. That's one about every 10 feet. And uh, this gentleman here is is actually learning to assess that by walking with his arms outstretched to the transect. Every time he goes across, it's a bunch of grass size of a basketball. He calls that grass. Or if he comes across a pickle thread size of a hula hoop, he'll say pear. And his assistant over here is writing that information down. So those are some of the kinds of information and techniques that we teach you at a Quail Appreciation Day. Uh, coming to the end, uh, the, one of the last things I want to mention is the statewide symposium. This will kind of be the uh, capstone of the two years of the Quail Decline Initiative. We don't know what will become of it. I don't know if it will be funded again into 2016 and beyond or not. But we're planning uh, what we call a capstone symposium a uh, year from now, 16th through the 18th of September. So mark the calendar for that. It will be in Abilene. Uh, we'll be featuring a tour of, uh, of a very successful property uh, in uh, Shackford County going over the various research updates that were funded uh, via the um, initiative, going with uh, some success stories, and several keynote speakers, uh, one of which, again, will be Chancellor Sharp. He'll be giving one of the luncheon addresses. Uh, Chancellor Sharp, I uh, met him a couple of years ago. He's frustrated quite hard like me and the rest of us are, but again, he's done yeoman service as far as uh, helping secure the funding for this initiative. And the last thing that I have uh, as director for the Rolling Plains Core Research Ranch, our 7th annual field day is upcoming on the 26th of this month. Uh, we have a good program planned for out there. If you've never been at the Quail Research Ranch, I certainly invite you. And for more information about that, you can go to quailresearch.org or go to our Facebook page for updates on that. Last, I have the 2014 quail hunting forecast, uh, and it's better news than it has been since uh, at least 2008. The weather pattern, uh, again, much of the, much of Texas, uh, has, most of Texas has seen better weather this year than we've seen the last several years. Some have seen incredibly good weather. Uh, we're still in the fairly dry spot uh, out here where we're at in West Texas. 
but it's better than it's been the last couple of years. The meteorologists are pointing towards the developing El Nino, and so we're hopeful that they're correct, and that El Nino will mean good things for quail. Numbers are up in just about all regions. Um, Texas Parks Wildlife Department will, will be releasing their roadside count uh, figures here probably in the next two weeks, so you can check their website for that and their forecast. But I've seen the preview of it. Uh, the coastal prairie is one of the areas that has, over the last three years, has had one of the best quail populations in the state. This is the area down between Victoria and Refugio, down that part of the world, and it saw a pretty Im incredible increase this year. South Texas Plains, uh, spotty, but again, most of that country, I'm getting some really uh, excited reports from some various people down there in the heart of South Texas quail country. Eastern part of the Panhandle uh, has been one of the wettest spots this summer, in my experience, and it's paid off very well. And then blue quail in general, uh, the Permian Basin, the southern part of the Permian Basin, the Trans-Pecos region, I'm getting some very excited reports on blue quail as far as and also out in southeastern New Mexico. So I hope you still got your bird dog. Don't Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, before we good thing, get to uh, answering the questions, let's give our speaker a big round, 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 round of applause today. today. You're going to have a uh, applause year. emoticon. Just and with that, Eric, the first icon of your name. Not the hand. That's the raise the hand. Over here, Push questions. down there and applause. Big round of applause. Thanks so much. That was very good. It came in loud and clear. This is a great time to type in your questions into the chat box there. And as you're thinking about those questions, I'm going to push out to you a survey link. This should open up a website in your browser window, which may be behind the webinar window or may come in front of your webinar window, so you may have to move some of those windows around. It also takes a while to load up because of the number of the amount of traffic, so just be patient for that. I will also put that link into the, te the text box as well. Very good. Okay, Dale, we've got some questions coming in. You could just move that window to the side there. Remember that if you missed any part of this, that this was recorded and will be made available to, to you, as well as the handout at forestwebinars.net. Yeah, we have a question there from Barbara. And she asked, how difficult is it to raise quail on one's personal land? If you want to raise quail from from eggs or buying two-day-old chicks, uh, that's not my forte, so I'm not going to tell you I have any expertise in that. You need to find somebody in poultry science or get on the Internet and look for, uh, there are several publications about raising quail like that in pens. Once you get them raised, again, trying to release them with the goal of increasing your quail population, I'm not optimistic that you'll do that. Uh, it's been tried many ways. Uh, Pin rear birds are just a poor substitute for a wild quail. And there's several reasons for that. One is most of the pin rear birds are going to get too heavy. They're going to weigh 190, 200 grams. A wild quail weighs 165. Which one are you going to bet on in the marathon? Uh, they don't have any street savvy. Uh, there's just several reasons why pin rear birds, if you're going to put them out, my advice is, is to put them out when they're 8 or 10 weeks old and then hunt them in the next couple of weeks.
and Eric, I'm still stuck on the uh, final slide here, so I can't see my chat box if there's any questions. Okay, Dale, we've uh, got a question from Jeremy here. And can you hear me okay? Okay. He asked uh, essentially what is the best uh, ideal fire, pre prescribed fire regimen? Every three years, every five years, every year, if it's to benefit both quail and other game species? Yes, I can hear you. That's going to depend primarily on your annual precipitation. If you're down in Florida, I talked about the success they're having. They burn every other year. It if back you're in West, in West Texas, Florida's if county. we burn any more frequently than once every 10 years, our fires are too hard on our woody cover, which is our weak plant. So you know, if you're in a 35-inch rainfall zone, uh, maybe on the neighborhood of three to five years, it's just going to depend primarily on the vegetation type and then on the annual precipitation. McMullen County, uh, again, um, one of the biggest factors that impacts what happens after fire is soil moisture. So, you know, if you had burned three years ago and then you go into this drought, then you're not going to be happy with fire. If El Nino is coming on now, we're going to have two or eight years in a row, you burn uh, this February, you're probably going to be quite pleased with it. You might want to burn, you might want to just try to time your burns. This is so Kim asks, uh, is anyone time, researching the impact of economic uh, decline in the working middle class purchasing power? You never want to burn unless you have soil moisture with regard in the ground. With regards to change you do, you're just asking for a bad plant response. Not that I'm aware of. I, I sense what her question is, uh, if, I, if I could rephrase it, is that quail, quail hunting has become grand opera in Texas. You don't, the, the average Joe Blow can't go quail hunting uh, with few exceptions. Now there's a little bit of public land, but Texas is like 97% private land. And unless you're a, a friend or you own land, and 19% of the quail hunters that we surveyed had bought land in the last 10 years, and so they would have their own land. But uh, your public uh, hunting opportunities are somewhat limited. You've got the Matador WMA, the Gene Howe, the Panhandle, the Chaparral down in uh, South Texas, and then the Elephant Mountain and a couple of them for blue quail out west. Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, Quail hunting is, it's, again, it's a supply and demand type of economics, and the supply is very low, and the demand is still pretty high. So we have a question also from, from Mike. the landowner's uh, level. It's do you think that the long leaf pine initiative will pretty eventually price. have an impact on quail populations? And I'm saying that it's not Texas. necessarily good. It's, it's quite bad for the recruitment of quail hunters. Uh, the average quail hunter is probably in his 50s, and so we're kind of killing the goose to lay the golden egg. Uh, Mike, I'm not that familiar with uh, that particular uh, biotic community, but as I understand, longleaf pine is a product of fire, and again, throughout the southeast, uh, the tall timbers down that part of the world, that's basically what they're trying to create is that uh, longleaf pine uh, burned ecosystem. Again, they'll burn it every year or every other year, uh, and it works quite well, and, and I know there are several different reasons for doing that. Uh, some of them involve Bob White, some of them involve the red cockaded woodpeckers. So uh, there's um, 
uh, you know, I'm just not that just, up to uh, speed on that. I would here, encourage you to visit a couple some, somebody type in uh, from the southeast U.S. or go to the MDCI National Ballpark Conservation Am I just while we're waiting, I might just mention again that uh, you can view this and many other webinars, either on forestrywebinars.net, or if you, if you prefer, you can go to conservationwebinars.net. I'll put that link in the chat box there. We have hundreds of webinars for you. Most of them offer CEUs as well. All right, let's see. Ken's asked, what about cost-benefit economic research for landowners? Is it profitable? Well, as I said, uh, five years or so ago, a typical quail lease would bring somewhere between 3 to $7, depending on whether you're in North Texas or South Texas. That same land for grazing might have been worth $5 an acre. With today's beef prices being up $2,000 or more for a pair, those economics have likely changed. But according to some, some uh, data available from our economists several years ago in Texas A&M, and it's a statistic that I cite somewhat, is that 75% of the cow-calf producers in Texas net less than $75 per cow unit. At a stocking rate of 20 acres per cow, that's 250 an acre. Nearly all of them, if they had quail, could make that much or more. So my point is, is to try to optimize that relationship. You cannot maximize quail and maximize cattle at the same time, but you can optimize that. And it'll probably mean reducing your stocking rate to where you're getting gains per head rather than gains per acre, but that's going to preserve more grass out there. I think that's all the questions we have coming in. We did have one comment from Chuck who was following up on my I would uh, refer you to uh, one of our comments that I've worked Texas, with Jason uh, Johnson, the US Dr. Johnson in our Stephenville office, and he and I have worked on that quite a bit, so that'd be somebody you can chat with. He'd be quite knowledgeable about your questions. Just a little follow-up there. I think that's all the questions we have, and I sure appreciate your webinar. It was very good. Thanks, everybody. This concludes our webinar. See you next time.